you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions. And you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1 of your booklet. Section 1. You are going to hear a conversation between Don and a rental agent. He hopes that his apartment problems can be solved. Now you have some time to read questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning. I am a rental agency. How can I help? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about some problems I'm having with my apartment. Yes, of course. If I can just get a few details first. What's your name? Don Chester. How do you spell that? C-H-E-S-T-E-R. OK. And the address? Apartment 4. 18 Ruby Lane. Ruby Lane, and that's in... In Newbridge. Oh yes, I know the one. Could I ask how long is the lease? It's for a year. And you moved in on... Last week, on 24th May. Good, thanks. Now, what are the problems you found? Well, nothing too serious, you know, but a few things that have been building up over a few days. Yes, of course. Well, the first thing is the fridge. The seal on the door is decayed, and we have a small child and need to keep milk cool, so we need to get that done straight away. OK, that's the fridge for immediate repair. And then there's a little problem with the gas water heater. Uh-huh. The switch is broken. Right. It's not serious, and we can still use it. But if you can send somebody over in the next couple of weeks or so, that'd be great. OK, I've got that. Then we're worried about the front windows. Are they broken? No, but there are no blinds on them, and you know, with privacy these days. And when would you like those done? Oh, it's not really urgent, but there are only thin curtains on the windows, and people are walking past. Yes, we'll have those done for you by next week, don't worry. And then there's the front door lock. It's getting quite annoying. It often jams, and we sometimes have to fiddle with it for minutes before we can get in the apartment. I'd really like to get that fixed up right away. That's no problem. And then the last thing is the shower curtain. It's torn. Oh, right. We can get a new one and have it to you in the next week, if that's all right with you. Yes, that's OK. Anything else? No, that's all. OK, fine. What we'll do now is get someone over to you this afternoon, if you're home. Well, I'll be out for a short while. OK. Tell us your preferred times. Well, the best time is about two o'clock. I'd have to check that with him. And if he can't get there then... What would be your second preference? Oh, any time up to 6pm would be fine. OK, I've got that. Great, thanks very much. That's fine. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. Goodbye. This is the end of Section 1. Now you have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a guide named Matt who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax, there are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a Beachcombers and Rockhoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in. But I would recommend my favorite tour, the Waterfall Walk. This departs at sundown each day and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the National Park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the National Park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. This is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You are going to hear a conversation between Bill and the counselor. You now have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now, listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions 21 to 25 by circling the correct letter A, B, or C. Hello, Bill. What can I help you with? Well, I was talking with a friend of mine who's doing a medical course, and he said that before I start taking sleeping pills, I should see you. I see. Well, I can't prescribe any medicine, Bill, and I prefer not to encourage anybody to take sleeping pills. What I can do is to help you look at why you're not sleeping. OK, but I think it's because I don't know how to handle all the work. I found that new students find college very different to school. The biggest difference seems to be that you have to get used to working more independently at college. And this can be difficult to pick up straight away. You can feel that you're not quite in control of it all. That's right. I mean, with only a few lectures and tutorials each week, it looks like an easy workload. But then you suddenly realise that there are assignments, tests and exams. I know I'm not the only one. I really prefer to work quietly in the library where the resources are. But its hours just don't suit my work and sleep habits. Yes. Having a lot of time to manage and having to arrange to get everything done and still have time left over to relax and feel refreshed usually needs careful planning. Yeah, that's right. I know. But it's hard to get started. My medical mate said you can help with getting organised, and I sure need it. OK, then. I need to get a few details about your timetable and any other commitments. You can put them all down on this form if you like. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Listen to the second part of the conversation and answer questions 26 to 30 by completing the notes below. Write no more than three words for each answer. Now, Bill, what's your main concern? Well, what really gets me down at present is that the exams are coming up and I don't feel confident. I know you've spent a lot of time preparing, so let's look at the actual exam itself. No matter how much preparation you do, it doesn't really count if you don't plan how you will time yourself to ensure you get to answer all the questions. Usually there will be some guide on the exam paper that will tell you the relative importance of each question, its contribution to your total mark. I see. So if I feel organised at the start, I can be more confident. Exactly. So once you've worked out an overall plan, and this can be done quickly, you need to make sure you know what each question is asking you to do. As a marker, I know what answers I expect to a question. Then you need to address the question, not just write down what you know and hope the marker will appreciate the hard study you've done. Yes, that's important. I can see that markers are looking at the questions, not trying to guess what we know. Yes. And the third point to keep in mind is that even if you know the topic well, you should leave time to go back and check your work for content. There may be an important point you have missed, or not explained as much as you wanted to. And at the same time, you can look for errors, including any obvious ones in grammar. OK, thanks. It's really simple in many ways, isn't it? This is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and all told interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and... Oh, sorry, no. It was women who said you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, this is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.